So we're in the book of Joel. And uh, we're going to go into chapter 3, kind of. But not really. Because we're going to take out from, from the book of Joel one of the main themes of the book of Job that Job talks about. Job, I'm sorry, not Job, Job uh, talks about. And that is the day of the Lord. He talks about the day of the Lord. So uh, as I get situated here, And we're going to be skipping around uh, on, on the book of Joel. It's only three chapters long, but we're going to read a couple of verses uh, on how uh, the prophet Joel is uh, emphasizing the day of the Lord. And when we hear about the day of the Lord here in the Old Testament, it also talks about, uh, you have reference in the New Testament as well, all the way to Revelation about the day of the Lord. And... Uh, but sometimes already to Israel, the day of the Lord has already come to Israel. And yet there are still prophecies that the day of the Lord has not come and it will come in the end times. All right. So and we got to understand that and we got to distinguish what has already happened, what is going to happen in the future and when, what is our role in it what type of it what importance do we play in it how does what's so significant about the day of the lord towards believers towards the church so we're going to go to joel if you're in joel we're going to skip around we're going to go to verse one um, uh, chapter one i'm sorry verse 15. chapter one verse 15. God's word reads this way. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. We're going to go to chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. We're going to go to chapter 2. We're going to stay in chapter 2, go to verse 11. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? We're going to go to verse 31 on chapter 2. The last verse of chapter 2. I believe it's the last verse. Second to the last verse. Chapter 2, verse 31. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We're going to go now to chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. And it reads, multitudes, multitudes in valley of decision, the day for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word, that you reveal your word, that there will be a special message for each and every one of us that is here today, Lord. And we pray this, that the Holy Spirit will teach us and that we will implement it in our Christian daily walk so that we can draw closer to you so that we can study to show ourselves approved so that we can uh, uh, preach your word to all nations in Jesus name amen. amen the word of the Lord the day of the Lord right the day of the Lord and sometimes you got to ask yourself how come the bad always seem to prosper right you ever ask it seems like right how come you know, people at work seem to get the promotion that don't deserve the promotion, but they end up getting the promotion. Right? We see that a lot. Or we see how the bad just continue to prosper while us, we go to church, we give our tithes, and, and we 
follow God and, and it seems like life gets harder, right? Or how come the government seem to, uh, or just the government in, in general, the governments of the world seem to, like we're, they're, we're disregarding God. We're leaving God behind, right? And we just look at our own government, how far we have come and, and where we're at and how we dismiss uh, God, you know, that no longer is our government saying in God we trust, but instead they're saying you must trust in us to supply your needs. And that's not what the Bible says, right? The Bible says that he will supply all our needs. God will supply all our needs, right? How, how uh, today man has gotten away with just blaspheming God, right? I mean, we see that every day. We turn on the TV and they're just blaspheming God, making a mockery of the church, hating on God, cursing God. And, and, and we see it on, on, on uh, churches that are, are uh, preaching false doctrine because preaching false doctrine is blasphemy toward the Holy Spirit of God. And it's just, but why? Because it just leads the people away, you know? But there is a day that's coming that God has declared in his word that the day of the Lord is coming for those who disregard him. It's a fair warning. It's not a, a sucker punch. When we come to Christ, God says in his word, if you do these things, I will bless you. If you don't, if you disobey me, guess what? My blessing will leave you. And so that's uh, uh, what's happening. How, how do we think that people are just getting away with it, right? And there's going to come a time that when the day of the Lord is revealed, God is going to intervene personally with his wrath and his judgment. And we, who always think that they're getting away with it, it's going to come to an end. Because God is not mocked. We might think that he... Uh, man is making a, a, a circus out of God's word, but God is not mocked. And God warns, the prophets are warning, the New Testament apostles, they warn of God that one day God's wrath will come upon the people. But if we're a believer and we seek after God, and we obey his, 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 his commandments and we sacrifice and we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice every day to him. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of restoration for the church. Amen. So you can see that the day of the Lord can be either one thing or another. Unfortunately, we living here... As the word of God says, right, when it rains, when he blesses, he blesses all people, the general blessing. When, it, when it's a, 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 a drought, guess what? We all endure the drought. But we know that God will supply our every need, every time. And here... The hammer has dropped on Judah, on Zion, on Jerusalem. Remember, Zion is Jerusalem, right? What's happening here? We know the story. I mean, we've been going it over for about the past five weeks about what's happening here. They've just been so disobedient, the, uh, the people of, of God, that God has finally fed up and a day of judgment has fallen upon Israel, the northern country, and also the southern kingdom, better said. Northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which is, the southern kingdom is Judah with the capital of Jerusalem in there. And why is this happening? 
right? I mean, God just doesn't bring judgment just because he's bored. You know, those are his chosen people, right? These are his chosen people. We are his church. God's intentions are to bless us. That is his will for us. You know, but, but something has happened here. And what has happened, pride has happened with Jerusalem. With Israel in general. That the pride has set in. Solomon, the last king that was, that was able to, to keep the kingdom together. After his death, the kingdom separated to the north. Ten tribes to the north. Two tribes to the south. And they started to, to, to have this, this fall. They started to get further away from God. And, and so pride became the hub, the, 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 uh, the, the centric problem of Jerusalem. They wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to make alliances with other nations. They wanted to make, uh, have this, this global community in that area so that they can be protected with other nations if a nation would come and invade. They wanted to uh, uh, adopt different customs that weren't godly. They wanted to be like other nations. And so this problem fell upon them where they can do what they want and still claim to be God's chosen people. And a lot of times, right, we want to still be called a Christian and hold on to God, but still do what we want to do. And you know why? Because of pride. Our flesh. Our flesh is what, what leads us to this prideful uh, uh, state of mind for each and every one of us. That's what draws us away from God. That's, that's uh, uh, what keeps us from res being restored by God. Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to read it here. But brother, if you want to put it up, that's fine. If you can get it. It's Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And I'm looking at the clock over here. And it, what you have here, thank you, brother. What you have here are two people. And there, these two people are going to go to the temple. And one of them, and they're both going to offer up to, uh, a prayer. And one prayer is going to be completely different from the other prayer. And we're going to find out, right? To some who were confident of their own righteousness, verse 9, and looked down on everyone else. And looked down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. There was two men, and they went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Like these robbers, like these evildoers, all these adulterers, or even like this man next to me. I thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector. Verse 12, I fast. Look at me, God. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I got. But the tax collector, here comes the other person. Stood at a distance. He would not even look up to him. He beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And then Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God for all those here it is. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Pride. Here you have one Pharisee who the people would think, well, if anybody 
can pray like that, who has the right to pray like that, it would definitely be this Pharisee. And you have to think about it. I mean, really think about it. Aren't you grateful that you're not addicted? Aren't you grateful that you're not going into your other family's house and stealing? Aren't you grateful that you're not, uh, uh, that you're giving your tithe to the church? You're, you're following the commandments. You know, and, 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 but Jesus is saying, hey, your motive is wrong. Your motive is pride. You're grateful because you can afford to give because this beggar can't give. You want to just flash your money and drop it up on the plate so that all can see. See, because God knows the heart. We don't know the heart. And the heart is what? Desperately wicked. It's desperately wicked and deceitful. And who can know it but God himself? And this, this Pharisee is pulling the wool over everybody, but God sees the pride. And it's the same way with the, the, these people of Judah. Hey, God, we're still your chosen people, but God, we're not going to trust in you the way we should trust in you. Because, you know, we have these other nations that want to get us. But, you know, we need to make an alliance with Egypt. And what happened in Egypt? They just got out of Egypt. God drove them out of Egypt. They want to make an alliance with Egypt because here come the Assyrians and we need some backup power. But instead of trusting God, God said, trust me. Trust me. And that happens to us a lot of times. We, 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 we preach, we read, we pray, we talk, we walk, you know, and we say, all we got to do is trust God. And somebody brings a, an issue to you, but well, brother, Trust God, brother. You just got to trust. I know it ain't easy, but you just got to trust God. And it's easy for us to say, but when the time comes to trust God, will you trust God or will you trust your own pride to make your own decision to bail yourself out? See, because a lot of people just want to blame other people. They just want to blame people. Well, you, did, you, you, didn't, you didn't stay there with me. That's why I went back to drinking. Well, you did not uh, bail me out. That's why I went back to my addiction. Well, you didn't. You, you weren't. You didn't pray for me when you said you were going to pray for me. That's why I don't go to church no more. Well, you didn't shake my hand when when I walked in the service. You just ignored me. That's why I can't stand being around these holy rules. And they just want to make, but the inside, it's pride. They're, they, they're not having the attitude of this tax collector and say, you know what, they didn't shake my hand, but I'm not going to wait for them to shake my hand. I'm going to shake their hand. I'm going to humble myself. We just want to, we want to make these excuses because we want to hold on to the pride. And, and, and uh, Judah wanted to hold on uh, uh, to their to their pride, and they, they just wanted uh, to do their own thing. And so we, we find out that pride, that pride uh, gives us the credit, right? Pride gives us the credit what God does in our lives. I did this. I built my home. No, God gave you that job to afford the materials to build that home. I found true love. No, God brought you to the right person. God put you up to that. I'm the one that was the only one to go to college in my family, and I made it out of the barrio, and now I live up there in the, in the Hamptons, wherever the Hamptons are at. I, I don't like <laughs> No, God gave you that endurance and that the, the, the support and the resources to go to college. God gave you the capability with memorization and learning skills to hold and retain, and God blessed you. So, but the pride allows you to, to uh, uh, give yourself the credit when God is the one who allowed it to happen. Amen. So, 
Judah's giving themselves all the credit. And when you give yourself all the credit, you start doing what you want to do. Because now I got it. I can handle it. I can take care of it. I don't need to trust God anymore. But I still am a believer. You're not too good of a believer if you don't trust God. A believer is somebody who trusts God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, and all their strength. That's the first commandment. That's a believer. But it was pride, right? One person left humbly and exalted by God. The other one left the temple a narcissist. A selfish, greedy, prideful narcissist. You know, because it, it was pride, right? It's, it's all pride. It's pride that caused this beautiful, angelic being to get cast out of heaven. It was pride that was introduced into the Garden of Eden to where both man and woman, uh, Adam and Eve, partook of that tree of knowledge so that they can be just like God. That's pride. It was pride that made Nebuchadnezzar behavior behave like an animal on his four legs eating the grass because he says, I built this kingdom. It was pride that Pharaoh wouldn't let God's people go. So God took his son. God took his army. And God took his kingdom from them. And Egypt, their, their authority, their, their uh, great army was now desolated. And now they were just nothing but a small country after that. It's pride that does not allow you to receive the Holy Spirit. An unbeliever to receive the Holy Spirit. The rejection of the Holy Spirit. Pride that hardens a man's heart. It's pride that hardens a woman's heart. It's pride that hardens a teenager's heart. It's pride, and God hates pride. He hates it. Keeps people from seeking his face. Psalms 10, brother, Psalms 10, 4. In pride, the wicked do not seek God. When you're prideful, you will not seek God. When did you come to God? When you said, Lord, I exhausted all my resources. You know what that means? I exhausted my pride. I no longer, you took it away. You depleted me. Now I'm spiritually black bankrupt. In verse 10, I mean chapter 10, verse 4 in Psalms, in pride, the wicked. Maybe I gave you the wrong book. Well, it says, uh, Psalms 10, verse 4, In pride the wicked do not seek God. There is no God to them. And the Bible says, Those who say that there is no God is a fool. <laughs> pride gives us the credit for what God does in our lives. Mm. We understand that. Why, why do these nations, you know, the United States, they, they, well, this, these colonies, these people, they... They fled England because of the tyranny. And they come and they establish a nation with freedom and with religion. And, and now we no longer have the full authority if you're keeping up of our religious freedom anymore. And it's close, uh, slowly being suppressed by our government because it's pride. We no longer, the United States no longer needs God anymore. We no longer need to pray in church anymore. We no longer have to have the Ten Commandments up on the White House or in the Capitol or in our schools. Heck, we don't even need them in the church anymore. We just need to preach positive thinking. Pride. Positive thinking does not come from God. Positive thinking comes from your own self-esteem. Look in the mirror. Tell yourself you look beautiful today. I look beautiful today. 
<laughs> don't think I say that every morning. <laughs> no, Mom, don't, don't reveal that. We're going to edit that. But, but pride is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle, right? And, and Judah was a theocracy. It wasn't one of our governments or parliaments. It wasn't the socialism uh, government. It wasn't uh, uh, a communist government. It was a theocracy. And a theocracy is where God is king of that country. Our hearts, right, should be a theocracy. That's what God, the anointed Messiah, is king in our lives. You know, the, the, the kingdom, Judah had three, three offices. They had the king, they had the priest, and they had the prophet. And the king's job was to, to enforce the civic laws of the country and to make sure the people, this is the king's job, to make sure that the people obey God because it's a theocracy. And the priests, their job was to uh, have the ceremonies, do the sacrifice for the people, represent, be the representative of the people to God, And then we have the prophets. Now the prophets were very special. I mean, the prophets were picked up, and this is what Joel was. The prophets were hand-picked by God. The prophets were the mediator. In the Old Testament, prophets were the mediator between the people and God. It wasn't the king. It wasn't the priest, it was the prophet. The prophet was the one that could, that could, whatever the word of the Lord came to him, it would go to the people and the people would have to obey it. Because why? Even though Joel speaking, even though Isaiah speaking, even though Elijah speaking, even though uh, uh, Je uh other prophets, the Nehemiah speaking. God is speaking to them. And they knew that. Have you ever, you know, and I'm going to give you a little military scenario. If, if, if there's a fire team, they get caught in a fire fight, and the captain goes down, and there's a corporal there, and the order, the mission is to hold down that hill Guess who's next in charge? It is that corporal, and that corporal has now been, is now acting captain of that fire team, even though he is not the captain. But yet, every order that he gives should be taken as he is the captain. And that's what it was with the prophet, that when the prophet spoke, God was speaking, and they understood, the people, that God was speaking. It was not them. And see, let, let me tell you even more authority what they, what they had. They were able to go into the king's court unannounced. And you don't do that. You go into the, you go into the White House unannounced, what's going to happen to you? You're lucky if you don't get shot. So what do you think is going to happen in a theocracy in the kingdom? They're going to execute that person. You don't do that. That's against the law. The prophet had the authority to walk in there unannounced and give God's word. How do we know this? Because Nathan went up to David. Nathan went up to David and he said, you are this man. David's pride, which got him in trouble. Nathan says, you are this man. So here's Joe, he's talking about Judah. Hey, the day of the Lord is coming. It's not me saying it, it's God saying it. God's judgment is coming to you. And 
And then, so they start to, to realize these things, and then they start to repent and all that. You know, we went over that stuff, right? And so, but as believers, right? How does that affect us? See, because the day of the Lord, Isaiah describes it, right? Not just Isaiah, but the other prophets. The day of the Lord is dark. The day of the Lord is wrath. The day of the Lord is doom and gloom. The day of the Lord is where uh, uh, one of the prophets, I think it was Amos, he said that your heads will be acquired of y'all. That the day of the Lord is going to be a, a, a dark covering cloud. That it's going to be destruction. It's going to be earthquakes. It's going to be famine. It's going to be pestilence. It's going to be all total darkness. The stars are going to fall down. The, 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 there will be no, the sun will be covered. I mean, it's just going to be terrible. The day of the Lord. Judgment's coming. And this isn't the prophet saying it. This is God saying it. And you, you, you go into the New Testament, and now through Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ has made us, right? Jesus Christ is our king. Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus Christ has made us all a priestly hood. See, there's, there's no more mediators, Right? The priest, we, we don't have to go to the priest anymore uh, like it was in the Old Testament for our sins to be forgiven. We go straight to God. Because now Jesus Christ is our mediator. So, and as a prophet, th this is our prophetic word right here. Everything has to be based on this. And today we have prophets that are running around that everybody, you know, has to, is a prophet. And, and there's different interpretations of a prophet in studying God's word. A lot of times being a prophet is just repeating what God's word is saying to you, preaching God's word. But other people claim to be prophets to make these decisions for God. And you need to be careful when you listen to those people. You just need to be careful. If it's not coming from God's word, then it's not God's word. The day of the Lord, right? For believers, right? The day of the Lord. 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord is going to be like a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire. So, remember at the beginning we talked about two things, right? Some of these things happened to Judah already, the day of the Lord, this judgment. It has happened to them. The Assyrians came in, and there goes the northern kingdom. The Babylonians came in, and there went the temple of in Zion. And so they got captured. And so that was the day of the Lord there. But there's also other judgments that are coming in. There's also other references that it has not happened. And that's what we're now looking at today. Some days of judgment have taken place, and others will come at the end of the age. Thank you, brother. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Bar. Bari. I don't know how are you pronounce it. Some days a judgment have taken place, right? The day of the Lord is also what? A time of salvation, right? Oh, man, I remember when Christ came into my life, that was, I was a small little, a long time ago. I was this small. Long time ago. Oh, but I walked away. But there was a revival in my heart, a restoration in my heart, and here I am today. You know? But the day of the Lord is coming. And it's a time that God will deliver 
Israel. Romans 11.26. Romans 11.26. This is when the day of the Lord comes. A lot of things are going to happen. We're still waiting for another day of the Lord. There has been some that have been taking place. I mean, we're seeing things that are unprecedented. Right? You turn on the news. Unprecedented. Oh, these, these tornadoes, we never had this many. It's unprecedented. Oh, these floods, we never had this many. It's unprecedented. Oh, these uh, uh, famines, we never had it this bad. It's unprecedented. All oh, these temperatures have never been this high. It's unprecedented. It's all, it seems like so many things are happening that are unprecedented, that are, that are not normal. And people are suffering for that with that and in this way all this rule will be saved as it is written the deliverer will come from zion he will turn godliness away from jacob the day of the lord's coming and you know what for us as believers it's going to be a good thing when the day of the lord comes why sin will be dealt away with completely death will be dealt away with completely Sin will be abolished, never to return. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, a restoration of your faith that is complete, full, never to suffer again. The day of the Lord is going to happen when, when, when it's going to confront this world in all its evilness, and the world's going to make physical war with God in Armageddon. But to us, that day of the Lord is going to be beautiful. It's going to be victorious. It's going to be a winful act. Because it's already a winful act. It's already been said. It's already been placed in the annals of the future, and it's going to happen. Let's finish it off with Revelation. Revelations 21. I'm going to do some reading here. We're going to probably read five verses. We're going to end it with that. Revelations 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven... And the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he, their God. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Or mourning. Or crying. Or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. That is what we're going to experience. In the end time, when, when the day of the Lord comes and has taken place, this is going to be the effect of it. This is going to allow the, us to, to claim those promises that God has said, right? They say, oh, well, God's been promising since the beginning of time, and he's not going to fulfill his promise. God's going to fulfill his promise. There's no time limit to his promise because God has, is the authority of all time. In him there is no time. He was here at the beginning, which did not even have time. He is here now. He is here infinitely. He is all created. He's the creator. There has been nothing that was created that was not created through him. That is him. He is God. He is sovereign. He says that this one day judgment's going to come, it's going to devour, it's going to destroy, it's going to renew, it's going to restore, and he's going to dwell with us in First John, not First John, but in John chapter 1, where you read, and the word dwelt among us, we're going to
going to find that out again because God is going to dwell among us again, physically walking next to us. There's not going to be no sun because his glory is going to be so bright. There's not going to be no, no, no pain because there's not going to be no sin. There's not going to be no hurt. We're not going to mourn because our loved ones are going to be right there. Could you imagine that? I wait for that day. To me, the day of the Lord is a pleasant thing that is coming, a pleasant event that is coming because I believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I trust in Jesus Christ and his church is protected by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. His church has been delivered by his blood and he will take care of his church. We might think that he has forgotten us, but God never forgets us. We are the ones that turn away from God. We are the ones that forget God. We are the ones that uh, invite pride back into our homes. But we need to start being like that tax collector. And we need to stop when we get into his presence. And we need to say, Lord, forgive me because I am unworthy. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. But through your grace, through your grace, through your work on the cross, you have made it possible for me to be in your presence as not only a sinner, but a forgiven sinner. Not only as a person, but a righteous person. Not only as a, 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 a religious person, but with a person who has a relationship with the Son. Now I can go straight to the Father. I don't have to go through no denomination. I don't have to go through no work studies, philosophies, and seminars to get to Christ. All I have to go, to get to Christ is to confess Christ in my through my mouth and in my life and to shout it out, Lord, I love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And I need you. And I want you. Forgive me. I want to have a desire to want to serve you. Humble me, Lord. Keep me humble. Restore my life. I want to walk with you. I don't want to say that I walk with you and then walk with the world. I want to walk with you and mean it. I want to be blessed by you. Lord Jesus, I don't care if I don't get to see the blessing here, but as long as somebody else sees the blessing, that is evident because of your glory, Lord Jesus. And we got to stop being selfish and expecting God to, for us to have evidence. Sometimes I tell God, I go, God, I don't, I don't mean to be this selfish and to be this prideful and to be this ignorant. But God, wouldn't it be something if you just show me a little uh, glimpse of the other side of the bridge? And he says, no, I don't need to show you the other side of the bridge because I am your bridge to the other side. Amen. That's all it takes because we walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, let us pray. We give you all the honor and glory, Lord. We just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that when this day of wrath comes, Father, we're not going to be a part of it because we are going to be protected by you, Lord Jesus, by your blessings, by your grace. And we know, Father, when this event happens, Lord Jesus, that we are going to be beneficiaries of this event because you are going to dwell among us already. The Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts, but the kingdom will be restored. The hev there will be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. No more pain, no more hurt, no more sorrow, no more lying, no more sin, no more death. It will just be your glory from here on out for eternity. We live in your glory. We will see your glory. We will rest in your glory. And we just thank you, Lord, for choosing us, a wretched sinner, to be part of of your kingdom, to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, to claim you, Jesus, as our anointed king, to, to confess only to you, Jesus, our high priest, as the Bible says, you are our high priest. That your prophetic words, Lord Jesus, will one day be revealed, will one day come to pass, will one day, Father, 
be the judgment on all the way. But until then, we will fight the good fight that you have called us to. We will continue the course. We will keep the faith. We will deny ourselves, Lord Jesus. We will humble ourselves, Lord Jesus. We will turn the other cheek, Lord Jesus. We will love our neighbors. We will love our enemies. We will pray for those who persecute us. We will live for you, Lord Jesus, until that day comes. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all the things that you have done for us, all the things that you're doing for us, and all the things you're going to do for us. You cover everything. You are the Alpha, you are the Omega, and you are everything in between, Lord Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you. Amen. I think we're having now, if you're only going to stay, if you're only going to stay for the uh, uh, VBS, we're going to be on the other side. And... Um,